Hey everybody, it's Romania Black. We are on episode seven of season two of Bungo Stray Dogs, Will of the Tycoon. And uh, I'm sure the Will of the Tycoon is gonna be pretty interesting because uh, the tycoon's ship, Zelda, just got sunk by our uh, our emperor's new clothes wearing Octagawa. Oh my gosh, that episode last week was pretty interesting. It felt kind of like episode 11 of season one where we had two different stories happening at the same time. We had, in the first part, we had Octagawa facing off against Margaret and Hawthorne and just wrecking them <laughs> and causing them muck and then Motojiro blowing up the ship, which I think, I think in the end Fitzgerald's gonna be more upset that the ship is sunk than he is about Margaret and Hawthorne, to be honest. Um, and then that was the first part of the episode with our uh, our diva, Octagawa. And the second part was our other diva, Chuya, showing up uh, at the secret base of the agency and basically threatening uh, Naomi and the other worker there, saying that they're going to go after him. And then, of course, that gets Kunikita and um, Tanazaki on the trail. So, very interesting. Chuya having gravity manipulation. Mm. I definitely, I think, I didn't look up anybody for this episode, but I think next episode I might look up Chuya, uh, maybe. I might look up Chuya next episode and see what all I find out about him. I mean, Hawthorne and Gone with the Wind with Margaret, I, I know both of those stories well enough. Nathaniel Hawthorne, I mean, the Scarlet Letter is all about a woman who's doing impure, impure things for the times, and she gets branded with a Scarlet Letter. And that's pretty similar to Hawthorne's powers. And then Gone with the Wind, Scarlett O'Hara, this privileged white girl in the South, <laughs> has things not go her way. Um, the famous quote, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, coming from her, her would-be lover. So I feel like those two characters with the guild, it's like, okay, cool. Um, but I may look up Chuya. I wanted to hold off on Chuya just a little bit and see if we get more with his character. Y'all have told me, and don't spoil me, but y'all have said there's a reason him and Dazai are kind of shipped together and it has something to do with his ability. And I'm like, okay. Which now that gives new context to Dazai jumping off the building in the season one opening because it's like, oh, you're jumping off the building and gravity is drawing you downward. Is that something to do with Chuya? I don't know. But uh, this season has been so good so far. And last episode felt like a little bit of a transition episode, kind of like episode 11. But I really liked episode 12 that came after it, so I'm pretty excited about this. And I like Fitzgerald's character so far. He's very intriguing. Um, him and Steinbeck seem to be chilling together. So, And we haven't seen Lucy in a while either, which is curious. So she's in the OP, which makes me think she's going to show back up. But... We shall see. But in any case, I hope you all enjoy this reaction. Please feel free to comment down below. Please, no spoilers. But yeah, let's get into this, shall we? We are going to start episode uh, six, seven here, episode 19 altogether, of Bungo Stray Dogs here in five, four, three, two, one, and let's go. Holy cow. This episode was amazing. I love this episode. I, what I love most about it, and it was what I've been worried about going back, because the flashback arc, the Dark Age arc, was so damn good. And what I was afraid of was, since it was based on a light novel, the last couple episodes, and I've been really pleasantly surprised, I was afraid that tonal shift was going to be jarring coming back to like the fun and crazy world that we've been with Bungo Stray Dogs. But, like, last episode was kind of, like, back to normal of what I was expecting with Bungo Stray Dogs, but this episode, with Dazai and the guild and everything, has established that, yeah, the, the tonal shift is not gone. Anytime we have Ango and Dazai and the Port Mafia involved, it, it's gonna have that darkness now, and I'm like, oh my gosh, but... There is so much going on in this episode. There is Will of Tycoon indeed. Fitzgerald, holy crap. There's so much going on and I want to talk about it with y'all because there's just, where do we even start? There's like this three-way war is like going all over the place and uh, I'm just, I, there's just, there's too much to talk about y'all. So we need to just go back through this. Oh my gosh. So... Lots of things happening. I like that Naomi and Haruno are like, get the heck out of there. I, I have to say, as soon as they got in that vehicle, I was having bad odor. I'm sorry, but after this whole thing with Ango in the car, anytime a character gets into a car now, I'm going to be afraid they're going to get hurt. 
Because <laughs> we had the van with the kids blowing up with Oda. We've had Haruno's car getting wrecked. We've had Ango's car getting wrecked. Everybody just stay on bicycles. Get on a train. Get on a plane. But stay away from your automobiles. <laughs> They're not safe in this world. I just... Oh, my God. But there's so much going on. I... I recorded the last couple episodes ahead of time, and so by the time you guys see that, you're probably going to be like, John Steinbeck's ability is not to teleport. Sorry. <laughs> Just, I, his ability is much more creepy than that. Yeah. Ah. Uh, and the thing of it, too, there's so many themes and things going on in this episode, and Steinbeck just being like, the grapes, the grapes of wrath. Literally, he can use these grapevines to control things around him. That's so good. And the callback to his... I like the duality of Steinbeck and his sister with Tanazaki and Naomi. I like that combination here, the parallel. Because like he said, he's like, my sister... my In the Grapes of Wrath, in the actual novel, their family is poor. There's a huge family. They are poor, and that's why they migrate to California, because they have no money. And so, I like that Steinbeck's motivations are the same as his character in the book, grapes of wrath it's like no my family's poor and if i don't do my job then they're going to suffer and it's like okay cool i'm still wondering why kenji i'm looking at the opening again why kenji has the stop sign okay but yeah so that ability is awesome i love that it's just controlling the plants and everything around him with the seeds my question is i wonder how many seeds if he has a limitless supply but i guess he can just take them from the grapevine i guess he can just do that but man Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Okay, yeah, there's somebody in the glass. I don't know. I've, I'm going to give up on it for now. But, mm. And we haven't seen the redhead kid yet for the guild. Um, for the Port Mafia, Q was not in the lineup there, which I guess they were didn't want to spoil Q. Q, interesting. So interesting. But, yeah, and I like looking back at this. I'm a little bit worried for Kyoka now. Uh, I'll be honest, after looking at this opening again, because Atsushi is walking through the place where him and Kyoka went on the date in the OP and it's gloomy and raining and he looks sad and I'm like, Kyoka just said she was going to save uh, Atsushi from Fitzgerald. And we just had that conversation with, with oh gosh, with Koyo, which we're going to talk about. Gosh, there's so much going on. But yeah, okay. And then Q, so we know who's in the OP now. Nice. And then Dazai. And I didn't notice this either. Dazai in the OP is his uh, dark age version with the bandage over his eye. So it's not the modern day version, which is interesting. Okay. So yeah, um, I, I will say this. Steinbeck is much more of a threat than I gave him credit for. And Lovecraft has tentacle powers. So he's OP off the bat, like the ancient one, like just the Cthulhu mother trucking tentacles. Yeah, no. And I like that both Steinbeck and Tanazaki have the same resolve towards their siblings. Like, well, we'd watch the world burn in order to do it. And Steinbeck is all about the guild is not an evil organization. He's like, we're not evil. He's like, the Port Mafia is evil. He's like, we're not evil. He's like, I'm just, a job is a job. So that's the thing. Fitzgerald has this whole guild built up as not an evil organization, but just an organiza organization that gets things done on his behalf. And whatever you have to do to get them done goes. So interesting and he's like no he's like i can't let you go because that's going to uh that will hurt my plans so yeah let's talk about kunikita kunikita just straight up shot them like didn't have the grappling gun no he came he was like no this is a serious threat he just straight up shot a uh, lovecraft and was like gonna shoot steinbeck's vines and everything interesting and it's like dude your resolve and the whole issue with morals. And I like his little back and forth with Steinbeck. That was really good. But yeah, man. Um, Lovecraft. I don't... I feel like we haven't seen all of Lovecraft's powers anyway. We've just seen the tentacles coming out. Like, he just looks creepy as all get out. Mm -mm. And he doesn't seem to really notice when his power activates. Like, what's going on? He's kind of like aloof. Ugh. They're such a weird, creepy duo. Uh, I get why they're together now. And then, yeah, Tanazaki, he's like, I'll do whatever I have to save my sister if it means convincing a, if it means, like, convincing a truck to hit you head on. <laughs> Which, you know what? You know what? Steinbeck and Lovecraft survived getting head on flesh contact with a semi-truck. So why should we think Ango's in trouble? 
Why should we? Why should we be worried about Ango and Dazai? We just watched Lovecraft and Steinbeck get hit on by a semi. We're fine. Everything's great. This is where it gets cool, though. So, this giant 3D game of chess going on, right? So you have the guild trying to kidnap Naomi and Haruno for collateral. Then you have uh, the agency trying to protect both of them, and then you have the Port Mafia over here. Then the Port Mafia is like Mori. Bless his heart, the chess master, one step ahead. He's like, we're not going to go after those girls. No, 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 no. The guild's going to chase them to us. And then we're going to put our chess piece on the train, ready to intercept them. But the genius part is, is it wasn't to intercept the girls. It was to get at Sushi, who is the actual threat. Because Naomi and, the, and Haruno don't have any gifts. They don't have any abilities. So they're not going to be a threat. But if we get at Sushi involved. He's the one with the power that can do some damage. So that is interesting. So Dazai and Atsushi were sent, meanwhile, to intercept the girls at the train. And I like Dazai saying here, Mori-san from the Port Mafia is the human manifestation of streamlining, which is exactly what he's doing. He's like, he controls the situation with cold mathematical detachment. And Daz I would know because Mori showed cold mathematical detachment when he sacrificed his chess piece of Oda to win the game. He's very, very calculating and cold and willing to do whatever it takes to win. And he's told Daz I that. He's like, if you're the leader of an organization, you have to be ready to do unspeakable things in order for your organization to survive. And Daz I knows this. And so, yeah, just... You can count on him to take advantage of the fact that we're letting our guard down. Uh-huh. And here's the scary part is, and the sad part is, Atsushi's met Mori. He has met him and taken advice from Mori, but he has no clue that it was him. And Dazai has no clue that Atsushi knows it was Mori. So it's like, ugh! And I'm assuming because is the only one that's really come in contact with Mori through the Port Mafia, that Tanazaki didn't know him either. But yeah, the design of... Q is so intriguing, like so, it says such a soul eater vibe, right? For a split second when that, when Q turned around and looked at the girls and had those like stars and moons in his eyes, which I didn't realize it was a boy, but had stars and moon in his eyes, it looked like, it looked straight up like a character off a of soul eater. Like the doll, the creepy voodoo doll, the stars and the weird eyes, like looks like they just plucked him out of soul eater and said, here you go, now you're in Bungo Stray Dogs. Very, very weird. With the two-toned hair. I kind of want to look him up next episode. Because I want to know what Q, this whole thing, the Q. I may look up Q for next episode. Yeah. But, okay. So, Dazai, playing it off like Dazai, tells that sushi he's got to go to the bathroom. But it's clear from the serious tone until he switches over to the bathroom that he sensed that at the act. Uh, Haguchi and Gein were there. And so that's why he went out behind the train station and was like, I'm going to get... Which he fell right into their trap. They lured him out, like, put the bait down and lured him. And Gein... I didn't know Gein was a girl! Dude! I guess now, looking at Gein, like, the way that her eyes are... Yeah, I should have realized, but no. I didn't realize Gein was a girl this whole time. And apparently Higuchi didn't realize it either, <laughs> which is amazing. So Dazai's known some of these people for a long time, but he doesn't seem like he's known Higuchi. So Higuchi must be newer to the Port Mafia because Dazai's been gone four years at this point. So Higuchi must be relatively new. Gene, would you put this away? It's dangerous. Oh, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. The one thing, the one aspect about Dazai that's very noticeable now that we've gotten through the Dark Age stuff is that when Dazai is serious, when Dazai is not playing around, his eyes lose that little twinkle, happy sparkle to him and they get really like dead and shark eyes. And when he looks at Gein and says, put this away, he has the dead shark eyes. Like he's not messing around at all, which is terrifying, right? And so Higuchi is like, yeah, you're right. We're not here to hurt you. And she has a message from the boss. And Dazai's like, oh, gracing me with his pleasure. What is it? And then, of course, it cuts to Mori. Dazai Kun, are you interested in coming back to the Port Mafia executives? And Dazai just laughing. Um, Mamoru does such a good job in this scene. 
such a good job. What a pleasant invitation. Ah, uh, your blood is mafia black. So she doesn't know him. So she, yeah, Higuchi's relatively new because she doesn't know Dazai from four years ago. So she must have came on only after Dazai left. Um, mafia black. Like she's like you, which as I've commented in previous reactions, he's killed a lot of people and done, like, he's like done like 700 acts of crime. So yeah, you know, more than anyone in this nation. He's like, people change. Which is funny, and, and you know, he says people change, but because it's Dazai, he doesn't want to address, the, he doesn't want to attract the t attention to himself, so he does a misdirect. He's like, oh, people change, like hinting that he's changed because of Oda, but he says, Gin-chan over there was a dainty little girl this tall four years ago. Uh-huh. And clearly, don't change the subject, and so clearly did Gin, when she was a little girl, have a crush on Dazai? Maybe? Possibly? And Higuchi's like, oh wait, like, like, like she's never talked before. And she's like, oh, she's a girl? What? Huh? Amazing. So yeah, then this whole misdirect, like this was brilliant. I loved this. Because I thought when the girls got off the train that Q had possessed them or done something to them or did something weird with the doll. Um, but that wasn't it at all. And Dazai being like, why would Mori San send people aside for this, set people aside for this trade to get Dazai away so that he wasn't, didn't see Q? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> set Q free. Meaning getting, got Q out of prison. Interesting. And of course, it literally bumps him on purpose. Q bumps him intentionally to get him to hurt him. And, oh, uh, and at Sushi's face, like, he looks so, as soon as he pulls the sleeve up, he's like, oh. And, yeah, attaching razor blades to his arm. Like, yeah, that's messed up. That's so messed up. Let's play. Uh, so it's kind of like, it's similar to Lucy a little bit, except Lucy creates a pocket dimension and Q just controls people and gives them hallucinations. And yeah, Daz the fact that Dazai is kind of scared of Q is problematic. <laughs> because when your most OP character in the show, which is pretty much Dazai, thinks that someone's a problem, that's pretty serious. So a walking catastrophe. He'll doom everyone, friend or foe. And she says, the Port Mafia doesn't choose its means to reach its ends. Yeah. And then, yeah, why do you think Q was imprisoned in the first place? So I want to know the backstory behind all this. This character. Mind control. Yeah, so. And of course the doll splits itself and that's when it activates. And so it makes Atsushi think that they're attacking him, but that's not the case at all. And then it all makes sense because Q says, you better do something or you're gonna die. Wait, what did he just say? Here's the thing. Yeah, here's the thing. That apparently he's getting strangled, but Q says you better do something or he's going to die. Which, either that's a mistranslation, or they were talking to her, talking to the girls, hmm, to get them to come up to him to try to help him. Because I'm guessing Atsushi was freaking out at this point, and the girls came up to try to help him, and then he attacked them, thinking that they were attacking him. Mmm, okay. Okay, that's that's manipulative. And then, of course, because it's hallucinating and everything, he goes back to the church and the orphanage and then, like, telling him that he can't protect anyone. Oh. And then he knocks her out, her, you know, which, in fact, what happened was he actually knocked her out for real. And then he thought that Naomi was attacking him and was going to strangle her. Oh, my gosh. And then the doll is the root of it all. Oh my gosh. But only a receiver is cursed when that happens. So, yeah, so it, so Q can't manipulate people just willy-nilly. Q can't just go up to somebody and touch them and they're manipulated. They have to hurt him to be manipulated. That's an interesting caveat. That's an interesting uh, quirk to the ability. And yeah, they brought him here so that he wouldn't get hurt. And he would, so that they could take out sushi. 
Everybody wants that sushi. Everybody wants him. Like, play the song. Yeah. And then... Yeah, he was going to choke her. Oh. And at sushi, who's had all this psychological trauma, is, of course, brought back to the beginning of it. Yeah. He's like, I was only trying to protect them. And I think it's interesting here that Octagawa appears. And the guy says, it's in your nature to be swept by power and hurt others. You'll never change. Uh. And then Dazai's like, let's get this doll out of the way. And then, of course, he sees Octagawa, which is interesting. Now do you understand who you are? Hmm. I find it interesting that, that we're, we're connecting in both the OP, the ED, and in this show, Octagawa and Atsushi, which they're connected by Dazai and his influence on both of them. But, yeah. And then he grabs the doll and destroys it. So I'm guessing the doll is something that can be regenerated, obviously. Your new friends are so fragile. Mmm. So, yeah, Dazai has history with Q. Interesting. And he looks super freaking serious. I look forward to breaking you. I love... Let me just say, if you go back and rewatch this episode, the shadow on Dazai and the way they animated him looking back towards Q before he turns around. Like, he's just... You can tell he's just thinking in his head and Q's just teasing him. Like, I look forward to, like, hurting everybody around you. And then when Dazai turns around to face him, Q, Yumino Kyusaku. Dogra Mag... Dogra Magra. Mm, yeah, I'm gonna look that up for next episode. In return for making me suffer, I'm going to hurt you, hurt you and break you lots. So something has happened. They've had history between each other. Hmm. And then I love Dazai's. Dazai, that's the most murderous expression. Like, holy shit. Like, since the Dark Age, that, the way they animated that, that murderous look where he's like, I won't capture you next time. I'm going to rip your heart out. Ah! Let's play again. Oh, my God. Like, so apparently Dazai took him to prison. Hmm. So here's the thing. Dazai is seeing Atsushi, like, break down. And at first he tries to be kind and comforting. He's like, let's go, atsushi can get up. And, oh, God, the way they animated him in this episode, the way they animated Dazai, this is the best they've animated him this whole season. Like, his expressions, everything. Like, everything is so damn good. And the way they've animated him, like, I just want, like, a frame-by-frame frame of this. It's just, oh, my gosh, it's amazing. But you can tell in this moment, because Atsushi and Octagawa are not that different. They really aren't. They have similar upbringings. They have similar fears. And they have similar concerns about how they're accepted and how they belong in the world. And Octagawa just wants to find a place to belong and be accepted and be recognized. And Atsushi just wants to be accepted and belong and save and help people. And both of them are so similar. And it's like in this moment, Dazai's realizing that. He's realizing how similar they both are. And I just... He says, I shouldn't have existed. And, and this whole thing about pity, because you know that Dazai's whole thing leading up through the Dark Age arc is that he doesn't feel like he should have existed either. Dazai's like, I shouldn't be here. And all the suicide attempts and everything is leading to the same thing. And so this moment where he like tenderly brings his head up and then just smacks the bejesus out of him. Oh, listen to me. I'll give you some advice for once, like a proper senpai. Stop pitying yourself. Pity yourself and life becomes an endless nightmare. Which he would know because he's gone through the same thing. When Oda died, like through everything, like if you pity and self-loathe, it's not going to solve anything. And Atsushi's just like, uh -huh. Uh -huh. like, you've been nice to me this whole time. And Dazai's like, uh, and Dazai's like, we don't have the luxury of choosing our methods anymore either. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Dazai is basically implying he's like the agency has been the agency has been doing things as kosher and as by the book as possible, but clearly, uh, clearly the port mafia is not playing by the book. They're playing dirty, and the guild is playing dirty too. So the agency can do all at once to try to be the nice guys, but it's not gonna 
last forever. And Dazai's like, we might have to do some interesting strategies to make this work. But that look on at Sushi's face where he's just like, oh, like you can just see he's seeing another side of Dazai in this moment. It's like, oh, honey, you have no idea. If the enemy wants to play their trump card, then we'll do the same. And his eyes still had that glare to them, that dark age glare. Ah! So next morning, there, there's so much happening in this episode. <laughs> so much. Um, okay, so Louisa, we get her, and I didn't put together Louisa, um, I think it's Ascot, she does Little Women. I read Little Women back in third grade. Granted, I was in third grade, so reading Little Women in third grade, I probably missed like half of what it was about. So I have to go back and research that. I might do that in a later episode too, but um, after we see her ability. But yeah, she has this big book, Guild Apprentice Louisa, Little Women. Um, which in Little Women, it's about all these sisters and they all have different ambitions and they're all going different routes and trying to do different things and they have different motivations. So I'm wondering if she just is like a multitasker. Maybe she just, maybe she does, maybe she's like their Ango and she gets intelligence on people. I thought it was Steinbeck maybe doing that this episode, but no, it might be her. And he's like, did you put me together a novel? I'll redo it. And he says, I'll read it along the way. So maybe she gathers intel for them and he's like, I need to read the intel. And then she's like, the cruise ship just fell. And I like that Fitzgerald says, the site for the guild is wherever I am. And it's like, ooh. I like it. He's like, as long as I'm here, the guild's not going to fall. We don't need a base. So, at Sushi, I talk about this with Koyo. I'm so intrigued. And she's like, I made a deal with Dazai. And I like that that she's very serious about it. She's like, he's going to find and save Kyoka, and I'm going to wait patiently here. And I like that, that she's like, I'm doing what I can to save her. Because she has the connection with her. She's like, we both have a similar ability. And she's like, I know what it's like to be used. And then at Sushi, of course, says he went to negotiate with a government agent. And I didn't put two and together. I was like, government agent? I thought for a second that he was lying and this black car pulling up was going to be the Port Mafia. Because here's the thing. They've offered him... Here's In the back of my mind, I know there's so much going on in this episode, but in the back of my mind, here's the thing. They have offered him... Mori has offered him a spot back in the executives. And here's the thing. Dazai is kind of like at sushi. He just wants to save people. And Oda said, be on the side that saves people. And I know he's told him that, but I'm like, dude, if Mori's like, I will protect the agency if you help me get rid of the guild. Because that would be a win-win for for Mori, right? Because Mori, the, the agency and the Port Mafia, they've been at it, they're each other's throats these last two seasons. But honestly, at the end of the day, the most that ends up happening is that they either kick him out, like in episode, back way back in episode three, when as Sushi was worried about the Port Mafia and the Port Mafia old Team Rocket invaded, Kenji and them just kicked him out. So they go round and round all the time. The Port Mafia has the business permit, so they're not really worried about the agency too much as long as they don't step out of line. But the Guild is a threat. The Guild is a legitimate threat to Mori. And so Mori's like, we can go round and round all day with the agency. That's not a problem. We do that every, that's a normal Wednesday for us. <laughs> but the guild has some very, very powerful members, and Fitzgerald's a problem. And he's like, I don't like this guy coming on my turf and trying to take my stuff. So I want to get rid of the guild. It all makes sense now why they want to get the guild out of the way. The Port Mafia is like, we can take care of the agency anytime. The guild's a problem. So I could totally see Mori being like, look, Dazai, if you help me get rid of the guild and come back as an executive for now... I'll leave your little agency alone and we'll just keep doing business as usual. And the problem is, I can see Dazai going back to him. I can. I can see Dazai going back, not because he wants to be in the mafia, but because he wants to protect the agency and Atsushi and do what Oda asked him to do. And he just said to Atsushi, he's like, we can't afford to pick our methods to reach our ends anymore. So he's like, we can't be choosy how we do this. He's like, the moral high ground's kind of getting swept out from under us. So I'm a little worried that Dazai is going to go back to the Port Mafia, even if it's for a little bit, 
to try to get rid of the guild and what implications that's going to have for the agency. And he may not, but just the way Dazai's acted this episode, it gives me bad vibes. It gives me really, really bad vibes. But I thought that it was Mori that was going to come out of the car here. I did not expect to see Ango again. I really didn't. I was like, holy crap. And here's the thing. And Dazai has that dead shark look in his eyes. He's not happy to see Ango at all. And Ango is not happy to see him either. So Ango, I was surprised when I received your call. So he's got these two executives with him. One of them's chewing bubble gum and he's got the sword, and the other guy looks rather plain, so I don't know if they're of any importance. And he's like, oh, hey, Ango, you're looking well. And then he reaches for the gun. <sighs> Do you think, why did you think I'd for, have forgiven you? Because, yeah, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the sad part is Dazai has not forgiven him because Ango was in on it. Ango was in on the whole thing. Ango knew that they were getting the business permit and making the deal to go after Mimic. And I'm sure that in some, in some way, shape, or form, Ango probably knew that Odo was involved. And he didn't try to stop them because he was doing his job. And so Dazai's like, I'm not going to forgive you for being part of the reason that my friend died. Ugh. And Ango is just doing what he's got to do. He's like, just kidding. I bet you left this thing unloaded. What do you want? Ah. Uh, the Gifted Special Operations Division is the most powerful secret gifted organization in the nation. So she's giving Atsushi the backstory that we know. Get them on your side and they'll become the agency's greatest weapon. Mm. And then Kyoka chan can come back to the agency soon. Wonder. So what she's implying here is that Kyoka's ability is the reason why she's an assassin. It's not just training, but it's the ability Demon Snow itself, and it's tied to her soul, which is interesting because it says as long as her gift is bound to her soul, she'll never escape the darkness. Which kind of makes her a lot like Dazai. That and it's kind of going back to what Oda told him. He's like, no matter what you do you're not going to escape this darkness. So it's kind of crazy. It's kind of creepy the way that, that Kyoka and Dazai are similar in that they're seemingly bound to this path. And at Sushi is just like, I don't understand. And Kyo and Ko Kyoya is like, it's because she's like me. I understand. And I can't get over how soft she looks in this. She looks so beautiful and soft. And I feel like she's being genuine to at Sushi in this moment because she does care about Kyoka and sees a lot of herself in her. So I find that that angle is very interesting. Oh, uh, and what did she tell him, though? Mm. Please take care of Kyoka. That's what it was. Which, <laughs> after this episode. So, then Daza asks why the Special Ops Division hasn't done anything about the Guild. And that they're not doing their job. And Ango is like, we're aware of the Guild's activities. And it's like, okay. And you let them off the hook. And so, Ango... Is like they've applied, and Ango's not looking at Dazai. He is looking straight ahead. He's like they applied pressure on the diplomats to grant their members the same immunities. Mm. So it's all political. They're above the law. So Fitzgerald's basically bought everybody out, and they can't do anything about it. They can't even take the guild into custody. And then he stops here. Here's the thing. He's like Dazai Kun, get out. But but why did you stop there when this car is coming? Tell your subordinates that their lives are in danger. Oh! Why? Why did you do that? So, did Ango intentionally stop knowing somebody was going to attack him? So that he could give that message to Ozai right before? Like, what the heck? Again, Steinbeck and Lovecraft survived a semi-hitting them, so maybe they're okay, but what the heck? And then at Sushi, of course, I guess that's where he was supposed to meet Dazai. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Fitzgerald knew where to find him. So the question is, now that we know that Fitzgerald's basically bought out, he's basically bought out the gifted operations division because he's like, they're not going to attack us. 
They're not going to put us into custody. We are fine. Um, I wonder if that's how he found out where Dazai was going to meet at sushi, and that's why he went to the bridge. <sighs> and then, of course, there's Fitzgerald. And, uh, a predictable reaction. So, I'm so curious his ability. I'm like, trying to think of ways, because the Great Gatsby, the Great Gatsby, is it just that he's confident that things will be fine? Is he just like as strong as he thinks he is? Because in the Great Gatsby, Jay Gatsby would say all this crazy stuff about himself as if it were true. And, the funny thing with that story is you're not quite privy to what is real and what isn't. You don't really know if Jay Gatsby's telling the truth the entire time or if he's fabricating or if he's exaggerating. You just don't know because he can prove parts of it, but other parts seem too outlandish and they don't add up. So I'm wondering, is Fitzgerald's power something where he can, like, manipulate, like, his own strength or how he can handle things? Because he threw the bullets and made them explode. Like, he threw the bullets with force. Hmm... Like, he just instantly kicks him up against the wall. Jeez. Uh, and the bounty I placed on you is seven billion. I can't buy you for that much. But don't get bummed out. You're valuable for other reasons. Why? And the way he says, come with me, is so disturbing. And it's the same thing all over again. That people are trying to take him away. And then Kyoka shows up. She's like, bitch, no! You're not taking my tiger. And she's got resolve, so I'm like, girl, are you going to use Demon Snow? And then, though the head may err. Ugh. But we didn't get a preview we didn't get a preview. How dare this show not give us a preview? You usually don't do that till the season finale. <laughs> We're not near the season finale yet. This episode was so good. It's so good and it's setting up so many things. And Maury's motivation and why they need to get rid of the guild. The guild's the problem right now. The guild is the problem. Because this is, this is the worst part of it all. Maury knows that the Port Mafia is an evil organization. He's like, our whole job is to gain wealth through any currency necessary, even if it's violence, death, and destruction. Maury knows they're an evil organization. He's like, we know that we're bad. He's like, that's why we had to get the business permit, so that we could have our things ratified. So Maury knows that they're the villains. But Fitzgerald and the Guild, they think that they're just fine. They're not bad. <laughs> and that's the worst part. It's like, we're not an evil organization. We're just getting jobs done. And if we have to crack a few eggs to do it, fine. That's terrifying. That's the scary part, is when you think that you're the good guys and you're not. Ugh. But I'm worried about Dazai. I'm worried about Sushi. I'm worried about Kyoka. We had Kyoka death flags in this, which I doubt Kyoka's going to die. But I'm worried about Kyoka getting hurt and then that drowning out at sushi even more i'm worried about dazai switching over back to the port mafia so <laughs> don't spoil me but oh my god this is fantastic this episode was so good i love this so much yeah yeah this is great this is a good time good times for all so yeah um i'm curious to know your thoughts down below um, don't spoil me, but let me know what you thought about the episode. And yeah, uh, next week we'll come back with episode 8. And here's the thing. Episode 8 in a 12-episode series is usually the episode I get really, really excited about. That I really like. But this episode was amazing. So, I am I got like episode 12 vibes from season 1 from this episode. So I can't imagine what the next episode's going to be like. I can't. Those of you that said season 2 is better than season 1... 100% correct. Absolutely. So, yeah. In the meantime, I hope you'll have a wonderful week. Stay safe. Take care. And I'll be back next week with more Bungo Stray Dogs. Bye.